I'm joined by Paul Shapiro, the author of the national bestseller, Clean Meat, How Growing Meat Without Animals Will Ref Revolutionize Dinner and, and the World. Uh, you're also the CEO of The Better Meat Co., a four-time TEDx speaker and the host of the Business for Good podcast. Thank you so much for joining me, Paul. Great to be with you, Daniel. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. That's um, a lot of things that you're up to. How do you have the time for everything? <laughs> Uh, you know, I have a really great wife who is totally cool with me doing a lot of work that is good for the world. So uh, I'm very fortunate in that sense. That's really awesome. Glad to hear. And uh, you are in a very bright green room. So where, where are you taking this call from? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm at the headquarters of the Better Meat Co., which is a uh, early stage startup that I co-founded a couple years ago. And uh, we, uh, our production facility uh, is in the warehouse that used to be a children's moon bounce facility so all the walls are painted very bright colors and the floors are all wacky and we like it uh, we could have spent money to change it but we actually kind of like it so we're not going to waste our investors money on painting walls that actually have nothing wrong with them i think that's fair um seems like a, a fun place to work um <laughs> i'm i'm so i'm really interested so i i read your book clean meat um and I thought it was absolutely fascinating. It's I've never heard of clean meat before um, I started reading the book or until I really encountered the work you're doing. And I mean, to, to be honest, when I first pictured clean meat, um, I kind of pictured this sort of meatball growing in a, in a vat and you, you pick it out with tongs when it's, when it's ripe and you kind of like pluck it off a vine. I don't really know what I was picturing. But how that would be cool. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. So how, how exactly does it work? <laughs> That'd be really cool. First, thanks for reading the book, Daniel. I'm, I'm honored Pleasure. that you read Clean Clean Meat. Um, other people who want to learn more about it can just go to its website, which is cleanmeatbook.com. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can buy it anywhere, Amazon, wherever else you want. So in short, though, clean meat is not an alternative to meat. It's not a substitute for meat. It is real, actual animal meat right. that is simply divorced from animal slaughter. So rather than having to raise an entire animal only to slaughter and disassemble that animal many months or years later, this type of meat is simply grown from that animal's cells. So if you think about like a tiny little biopsy from an animal, like a sesame seed sized biopsy, in that little tiny piece of flesh, there is millions, there are millions of uh, little satellite cells in there that all they do is produce more muscle. They just grow more muscle. And they have, you have them in your body, Daniel, I have them in my body, chickens, pigs, cows, they all have them in their bodies. And if you take that out and you put that into a, into a cultivator that replicates the conditions of the body, so similar temperature, feeding at the same type of nutrients, those cells do exactly what they would do were they in the animal's body, which is they produce more muscle, uh, right. what we call meat, what we call meat. And so uh, when you think about how it grows right now, the leading technologies in the space are growing a ground meat. So no, it's not going to come in the shape of a meatball, but you can <laughs> form it into a meatball. Uh, and I, I've had uh, meatballs grown from animal cells. They taste really good. Um, you know, people ask if they taste like meat, and indeed they do because they are meat. Um, you know, again, it's not like this is, you know, trying to coax plants into tasting like meat. It is real, actual animal meat. So, yeah, don't think about things coming in preformed patties or balls, but you can make them into that for sure. So how do you actually take, I mean, what, what is it exactly that you're taking and forming it into, I guess, mm -hmm. meatball or... Uh, well, you said it's all ground meat, so it would be different. Yeah, so you think, think you can make sausages, meatballs, nuggets, burgers, patties, uh, really anything that can come in a ground meat form you could make. Now, there are some companies in the space that are also working on whole cuts of meat. So uh, wow. one, uh, one queen fish company based in San Diego, which is called mm -hmm. Blue Nalu, uh, I recently ate their whole muscle yellowtail, um, and it's uh, really delicious. Another so that, company, sorry, just to jump in, it looks like an actual piece of yellowtail. Yes, because that's what it is. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> so anyway, you know, point is that um, there are companies who are pioneering whole muscle cuts as well, but it, that, that is, uh, it's the minority of companies that are doing that. Yeah. So when it, because I, I think I, I read in the book, it, it comes out in strands, or at least, well, I mean, this was two years ago that you wrote the book, so things I'm guessing have changed. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is still a primarily a ground meat game. And so, yes, it comes in like small little pieces that you assemble together in the way that you would take ground beef and make it into a hamburger, right? Um, but uh, there is an increasing number of companies, including, uh, let's say, one in Israel called Awa Farms, which is making like little mini steaks uh, also. So they're making like thin strips of steak oh, wow. that are much thicker than ground meat, but they're not, you know, yet a T-bone. But uh, the technology is progressing. And yeah. it's really coming along. And this is a type of technology that can do an enormity of good in the world, can produce meat for a tiny little sliver of the fraction of resources needed to produce meat of today. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, from an environmental perspective, you're basically removing animals from farming practices. Yeah, that's right, Daniel. So it takes a lot of land to produce meat. It takes a lot of water. It takes a lot of energy, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. And it just takes a lot fewer resources to yeah. produce plant protein. Um, the problem is that people want to eat more and more animal protein. Uh, meat consumption is going up, not down. Yeah. We know about the success of products like Impossible Burger and Beyond Burger. Those are awesome companies. I really admire them uh, and I'm rooting for them. But meat consumption continues to rise on a per person basis. Mm. It's not just that there are more people on the planet, it's also on a per person basis we're eating more meat than ever before. Yeah. And uh, so, if you want to, uh, you know, give people their meat that they want, you want to like, you know, let them have their meat and eat it too. Essentially, you can grow real meat and make the meat that people really want and just divorce animals from the equation altogether. Yeah, it's interesting because um, you're, you're vegan, right? I am. And is it, do you consider it vegan? No, definitely not. Okay. Uh, so, you know, queen meat is not a vegan food because it is an actual, it's actual animal meat. Right, But the reason why somebody like me would choose to eat a plant-based diet is out of concern for animal welfare, out of concern mm -hmm. for the environment. And those concerns are obviated by this type of a technology. So I've eaten clean meat on many occasions now. I've eaten clean beef, duck, fish, liver, uh, uh, foie gras, chorizo, and so on, uh, because I don't have any concern about it. I'm quite happy to eat it. Now, admittedly, you know, I made the decision to uh, choose a plant-based diet in 1993. So I've been enjoying a plant-based diet now for nearly three decades. Wow. And I don't really have a big desire to eat meat as a result of this. I don't mind eating it. I'm really concerned about eating it. And I do eat it. But even when queen meat is on the market in a meaningful way, I probably would continue eating a plant-based diet not, uh, for a variety of reasons, one of which is just habit in my life now. Yeah. Um, but for people who are wedded to what they perceive as like the so-called real thing, or you know, real actual animal flesh. Uh, this is a good way to help satiate that desire for them. Yeah, and is it? I mean, <clears throat> I, I guess this is kind of a silly question because you've said it multiple times that it's it is real meat. But I mean, when I think about and and you talk about this in the book as well that when I think about it growing in a petri dish, it, it's kind of strange. It, it just makes me feel like it, it may not necessarily be safe, or or maybe it's not. Um, natural and I, I know you talk about it extensively but I, i'm just i really want to hear you you explain it because <laughs> it's it's so it's just such a bizarre concept <laughs> well yeah i mean i would say first and foremost don't think about it growing in a petri dish <laughs> that's not how it grows okay uh so you know if you walk into a guinness factory right now uh -huh. what you're going to see are huge bioreactors filled with brewing microbes we call it brewer's yeast but they're brewing microbes. You're going to have PhD microbiologists walking around with white coats and they're going to be taking notes, but you don't think of it as lab grown beer. You know, you're not going to say, ah, oh, the beer was grown in a Petri dish. It's grown in these huge bioreactors. as right. we call it a brewery. Um, and the same is so as to how you grow meat. You put it into these cultivators that look just like a beer brewery, really, mm. except instead of brewing brewer's yeast, they're brewing animal cells. And the product, instead of alcohol, is actual meat. And we use this type of technology for all different types of things. It's how we produce vitamins today. It's how we produce the insulin that diabetics take today. Um, it's how we produce rennet for cheese, which mm. is uh, basically a way to get uh, cheese to become a hard cheese. Um, and so it's not as if these type of technologies are unheard of. It's simply that we're now applying them to different types of uh, new products to actually make. And in this case, we could make actual animal meat with it. And so 
if you think about, um, I, I think about how we used to contemplate ice, right? Like until 150 years ago or so, all of the ice that anybody ever purchased was coming out of nature. It was harvested from a frozen lake and then it was put in an insulated boat and it was trucked, or not trucked, excuse me, it was you know shipped all around the world in these insulated boats. And so the only way people had for, to get ice for thousands of years was out of nature. Then you have the advent of refrigeration. All of a sudden you can cool the water in front of you down and make ice, but it's still ice. It's just, instead of coming out of nature, it's coming through a technology. And of course the ice barons of that era were living over yeah. this technological innovation and they railed against what they called artificial ice. And they said, this was unnatural. It was dangerous. You didn't want to give it to your kids. You didn't know if the ammonia and the coolant could sicken you. You fast forward to today and everybody has an artificial ice maker in their home. We call it a freezer. We don't think it's anything artificial about it at all. In yeah. fact, we probably wouldn't even consider ever living without one. And the same is so with meat, that for thousands of years, the only way we've had to get meat was out of an animal's body. Well, now we can produce the same meat from the very same cells, except through technology rather than coming out of the animal's body. And in the same way that ice from your freezer is much safer than ice coming out of a lake, this type of meat is also going to be safer. Yes, it's more environmentally friendly. Yes, it's better for animals, but it's also going to be safer. Think about it. Right now, if you have raw meat, you have to treat it almost like toxic waste, right? Yeah. Like if it's in your supermarket basket, they have to put it in a separate bag. If you bring it home, if it touches your counter, you have to disinfect your counter. If it touches your hands, you need to wash your hands. That's because it's dangerous. It's got fecal pathogens on it. E. coli, salmonella, campylobacter. These are intestinal pathogens that can sicken us if we don't cook the crap yeah. out of our meat, literally. <laughs> so you're literally doing cooking the crap out of the meat. Gross. But with clean meat, you're not growing intestines at all. So you have to worry much less about intestinal pathogens than with conventional meat because you're just growing the muscle and the fat that we actually want in the meat as opposed to growing the uh, entire animal with intestines and all. And so that's one reason it's often called clean meat is because from a food safety perspective, you know, you're more likely to infect this meat with your hands than it is to infect your hands if you touch it. So yeah. um, big food safety benefits in the same way that refrigeration allows us to use uh, ice from water that was, you know, filtered or boiled before it ended up becoming ice. Yeah, it's interesting because, well, th yeah, thanks for, for outlining that. And I think um, what's really interesting is that the the ice analogy, well, not analogy, I mean, that, that's what really happened. That took so much more energy. First, you have to get the ice, then you have to pack it, ship it. And and similar to the, um, to the meat, I mean, and, and I, I'm pretty sure you wrote about it in the book, like you have to create an entire animal just to get a specific cut whereas and i guess that's the point is you can actually just grow a specific part of it and say well here's that part of the steak or here's just the the, the piece you need yeah exactly daniel i know that you are in london right now so let me tip my hat uh, to winston churchill who in 1931 wrote an essay and said in which he said that we will escape the absurdity in the future of raising an entire animal just to get the wing. Yeah. People will think, why would you want to raise a whole chicken, subject that animal to torture often, mm. and then slaughter them in violent ways that few people even want to hear about, let alone witness, and then just to get the piece that you want. Whereas yeah. we can, uh, in the future, we'll be able to grow these types of meats in a far more environmentally friendly, far safer and far more humane manner that will create a better meat industry. This isn't about ending meat consumption, it's about making meat better mm. uh, and to create actually a better protein industry. Think about it kind of like, uh, if you contemplate like photographs, how we used to have this industry right. where it was all based on print photography. I mean, I, I remember actually when um, One Hour Photo came out, and one hour photo, I was amazed. I couldn't believe we we're getting our photos in one hour. I mean, it was really incredible to me. Now, if it took a minute to get your photo, you'd be outraged, right? Yeah. I mean, imagine if it took one minute to get a photo, I mean, people would be up in arms. Apple would, their stock would plunge. I mean, it would be horrible, right? Um, but photos have not changed, right? They still are just capturing our memories. They're just a lot better. Like digital photographs, they're just much, the reason why we all use them is because they're just much better. They're more convenient. They're, I mean, everything about them is just a superior experience for us for the most part. That's why we all use digital photographs now. 
Um, but we haven't stopped using photographs. We haven't stopped capturing our memories. Yeah. And the same is so with meat. You, you're going to have future types of meat that are just so superior environmentally, ethically, food safety, than the ways that we've produced meat in the past that people will just naturally prefer them. Makes sense. One, one question that I just thought of, um, how would it work? So like Kobe beef, for example, um, is quite a specialty and there's a lot that goes into how the actual cow is raised in order to get that kind of flavor and texture of the, of the meat. Is that going to be possible to grow as well? Yes. So, I mean, right now we have a situation where we have domesticated animals over thousands of years. Mm -hmm. We've selectively bred them to essentially get like the most type succulent types of meat or the fastest growing animals or right. whatever we've selected them for, the most amount of egg production, most amount of milk production, et cetera. Well, now we're in the process not of domesticating animals, but of domesticating their cells and creating different cells that make the most succulent types of meat different cells that maybe make the most economic types of meat because they happen to grow faster, hmm. different cells that will create new culinary experiences for people that maybe nobody has ever even experienced before. So think about, for example, Daniel, if you uh, take the time between when cows were domesticated and before we had cheese. So people knew milk, but yeah. they had never conceived of cheese. Never had Gouda, never had Brie, never had American or Swiss or Cheddar or anything else. These are, yeah, right. Very, <laughs> these are what they call the dark ages, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, then somebody invents cheese, figure out a way to get milk to curdle. And now you have an entirely novel realm of culinary experiences to humanity mm. that no person has ever even, not only, not only tasted, has ever even thought of, never even imagined. Right. Well, when you, when you divorce meat production from animal raising and animal slaughter, you open up new realms of possibility as well. Mm. So we could have different types of protein experiences in the future that nobody has even contemplated because it hasn't been possible yet in the same way that Swiss cheese was not possible before the curdling of milk was invented. Yeah. Um, so I think of this not only as a way to solve some of humanity's most pressing problems by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, reducing all the negative problems that we associate, correctly so, with animal agribusiness, but this is also a way to give even better culinary experiences to humanity in the future. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, I, I can only imagine what, well, like you said, it, I probably actually can't imagine the kind of cool yeah, stuff. You that <laughs> oh man, no. what an exciting world to live in. Yeah. yeah. It kind of, I really like the part in your book where um, there was, I, I, I don't remember who it was, but one of the, one of the founders of these companies was able to get Mastodon, like, the old elephant um, yeah. and he made protein gummy elephants out of it. <laughs> yeah. So you're referring to a company, Daniel, it's called gel tour and right. they're based in the Bay area. These okay. uh, two, these two co-founders, Nick and Alex. And what they did was essentially uh, figured out that they can get microbes to essentially create collagen, which is the building blocks of gelatin that you would make jello or make, you know, mm -hmm. gummy bears out of or whatever. And uh, the mastodon genome is available because even though, uh, even though humans rendered them extinct when we moved into North America, um, like if you think about like, you know, probably 10, 13,000 years ago or so, like the mastodon in North America went extinct because essentially uh, I guess they wouldn't be indigenous people back then because they were just new to the continent. But oh, the yeah. first humans who arrived on the continent uh, basically uh, seemed to have hunted them to extinction. But some of them got trapped in icy graves. And we've uh, excavated them, and you can actually extract some some of their uh, genes and, and from there. And so we have the, gen the genome of the mastodon is all mine. So Nick and Alex took that, and they actually then encoded it into their microbes, and they produced real mastodon collagen and then they made gummies, not gummy bears, but gummy elephants out of them. And they ate them. They actually ate them. And this is the first time anyone has eaten mastodon protein in thousands of years. I mean, think about how interesting that is to be the first humans to eat mastodon protein in thousands and yeah. thousands of years. Um, and really coolly, Geltor also made for my book, Clean Meat, they made a lab-grown leather cover. So for the very first copy of Clean Meat was the first ever and still only ever book bound in lab grown leather. And we put it up on auction and uh, one lucky bidder got the uh, highest bid. It was 13,000 US dollars wow. for the, first, the world's first ever lab grown leather bound book. 
and uh, all proceeds went to charity. I went to the Good Food Institute, which is a nonprofit organization that helps to promote this space. And so, you know, you can see these really cool things, you know, eating protein from extinct animals, making leather bound books out of lab grown leather. I mean, it's really, uh, it's like a really cool uh, novel experience that nobody had ever thought of. We are living in the future. This is it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, that's the so true. Was the leather bound book made from Mastodon leather? No, that would be pretty awesome. Um, but uh, no, it was not made from Mastodon leather. In fact, okay. interestingly enough, it was <laughs> it was made out of jellyfish leather. So I know that's wow. not as uh, you know not as like intriguing as if they had just used cattle uh, collagen. But for a variety of reasons, they ended up using collagen from jellyfish. So that's it looks cool. and, and performs like like um, like cattle leather. But it is, uh, you know, probably the world's first ever jellyfish leather bound book also. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> what a unique place to get that from. I would have never thought to go for jellyfish. <laughs> um, yeah. I'd, I'd love to, I mean, this clean meat is fascinating and the book was really great. So thank you for, for thank writing you. it and, and for sharing all of the knowledge that you got from it. It was awesome. Um, I really want to talk about Better Meat Co. because I think... This is, and, and, and this is where you are right now. And I, so you kind of mentioned that there is the Impossible Burger, um, but Better Meat Co. isn't trying to create like a new plant-based option. Um, mm -hmm. And I, that part is, um, I think what's so unique about Better Meat Co. is you're blending. Um, so like, why? For lack of a <laughs> great question, no, no, I like it, Daniel. It's I like the bluntness. Yeah. Uh, so you know, look, uh, I love Impossible. I love Beyond. I love these companies in the space. I buy their products. I, I've been yeah. them for them. I admire them. I just um, had Impossible but, Burger for the first time, and I was impressed. Very impressed. Good. Yeah. Good. Well, that's awesome. I hope many other people have that same experience. Yeah. I'm um, sure they will. But you know, think about it like this: uh, the problem of fossil fuels is so severe so bad that you want lots of alternatives. You want wind, you want solar, you want geothermal, you want more. Well, the problem of factory farming is also so bad. You want lots of alternatives. So yes, you want clean meat. Yes, you want plant-based meat, but those aren't the only two options. And in fact, uh, blending may end up being something that at least in the near term can have an even bigger impact. So let me give you an example. Imagine that uh, you are the director of dining at a corporate cafeteria and you're serving pork sausages. And then you decide, hey, I want to offer a plant-based sausage and see how many people will switch. And by some miracle, you're going to charge the same amount, which is, of course is not what's going to happen, but in the real world, but let's just say you're going to charge the same amount. Lunchtime comes in, people file in, they start ordering the sausages. Uh, probably, I don't know, you tell me, Daniel, what percentage of people who would have bought the pork sausage do you think are going to say, ah, I want that new vegan sausage? What do you think? What percent? I think it depends on where you are, but if let's say we're in California and we're being very, <laughs> um, we're being very uh, liberal, then maybe five to 10 percent? Sure. I think you're right about that. I think that would be a big success if five to 10% were to convert over. That would be big. And keep in mind, plant-based meat presently is less than 1% of the total meat market. So, wow. um, but let's just say it's five, five to 10%. Now let's say if either instead of, or even in addition to offering that plant-based sausage, you make the regular sausage 50% plant-based. So it's, you know, 50% plant, 50% pork. All of a sudden you've had a much bigger reduction in meat consumption. In mm. other words, a much bigger advancement in sustainability than merely offering a plant-based option. So yes, companies should offer plant-based options, but the regular default option that nearly everybody is going to buy should also be better. And mm. so I think of it like beyond and impossible. These companies are like the Teslas of the space. They're really cool. They're all electric or all plant-based. They're awesome. Um, but they're really expensive, right? They're just really expensive. Uh, they're much more expensive than the cost of commodity chicken, commodity beef, and commodity pork. Well, what if, uh, you know, and that, that's why less than 1% of vehicles sold are electric vehicles. Makes sense, yeah. But if you could make the 99% of vehicles that are being sold be more fuel efficient, if you can improve fuel efficiency across the whole spectrum there, you would end up reducing gas usage much, much more than if you doubled or tripled the amount of uh, 
of uh, all electric or all plant-based yeah. going in. So that's the premise behind the Better Meco, but we don't make mm. hybrid products. We don't make finished goods. We're an ingredients company. So we only make plant-based protein formulas that are designed to seamlessly blend directly into animal meat. And we sell our products to meat companies for them to blend into their meat. So we're not trying to get people to switch from you know meat company x to our product we're right. trying to get meat company x to utilize our product in there so they can create better meat meat that's going to taste better it's going to be better on nutrition better on sustainability um and you know it's going to have less saturated fat less cholesterol fewer calories more fiber and it's going to use fewer animals and have a much lighter footprint on the planet so that's the whole premise behind what we're doing makes sense so they're and they're all um everything you make is made from plants uh, yeah, we're a plant-based company, um, and so we utilize technologies that allow us to very inexpensively convert plants into plant-based protein formulas that blend into meat. So if you're a beef producer and you're going to use our products, you're actually going to not be spending more for the plant-based protein formulas. You'll be spending less. Makes sense. I'm actually going to um, just share my screen here briefly because I'm, I'm on the Better Meat Co's uh, website and i'm just looking at your products because you have a few here there is this is the chicken which is called albina so so what you're doing so this is how much percentage chicken is in this one uh these or, products sorry, this that you're is, looking this is pork actually uh, so yeah it's a pork photo so that's two-thirds pork one-third better meat co plant protein uh but we also uh do some formulas that are designed to go up to 50 percent. so oh, wow. for example um, Purdue, the major chicken company, uses mm -hmm. our ingredients to make a line of products they call Purdue Chicken Plus. Mm -hmm. And Chicken Plus is 50% chicken, 50% plant-based. And you can't tell the difference. You consume it, uh, you just can't tell any difference. It looks and tastes just like a regular chicken nugget. Yeah. And so the fact that they're calling it Purdue Chicken Plus, they're obviously really proud that yeah. there's plant-based Oh yeah, this is a marketing advantage. They yeah, have a product totally. that has the same amount of protein, but less saturated fat, less cholesterol, uh, more fiber. I mean, this is a, a better product. And yeah. so, yeah, you know, it, imagine if you go like, for example, Daniel to Jamba Juice and you get a smoothie and then you ask them to boost it with matcha or, you know, mm. some type of a protein. Like that's what this is similar to. They're boosting their product with plant protein with, yeah. with really healthy clean plant protein so it's kind of like uh, a boost to their product so of course they're proud of it because it's a better product it's the same reason you would spend more to add something to your smoothie to boost yeah. it you have better nutrition well that's what this product is yes you're still getting chicken but it's been boosted with really healthy plant protein as well that's super cool in the uk there's this concept um that the government kind of shares with with everyone which is called get your five a day i'm not sure if it's in the u.s mm. but five a day is yeah. talking about your vegetable and fruit intake and mm -hmm. um it seems like this is such an easy way to <laughs> like while you're having your chicken nuggets for lunch you're also potentially getting your five a day it could be a really great i mean I, i'm sure company meat companies here would absolutely love that as a marketing uh, yeah so Purdue, uh, yeah purdue markets it actually as um a quarter cup of vegetables per serving of chicken okay. nuggets there you go, so yeah. this is a way like if you're a you know a busy mom your kids don't want to eat their veggies well they'll certainly be happy to eat chicken nuggets well why not you know have chicken nuggets that have their vegetables in them mm. and they look and taste the same i mean it's not like as you just saw it's not like you can see any difference no, you certainly can't, can't taste any all, difference yeah. And so it's just a good way to, you know, help get more vegetables into your kid's diet if they are, you know, going to insist on eating chicken nuggets as an yeah. example. <laughs> Not that chicken nuggets are a good default, but anyway. Um, I, I'm... <laughs> yeah, but it's just the reality for a lot of, I know. For a lot of busy parents, you know. Yeah, just the very default. true. I'm, I'm curious now as a, since you are a vegan, have you actually tasted Purdue Chicken Plus? You know, I, I will sometimes like uh, try the blended products to see what they taste like. I don't usually swallow them, <laughs> but I will try them. But it doesn't really matter what I think, honestly. Like yeah. It just doesn't matter. Like what matters is what everyday uh, meat consumers think. And so we do regular focus groups with consumers to get mm -hmm. their opinions on it. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I have tried it out of curiosity, but I, I don't have some desire to eat it myself. And certainly most of our staff is, acts as a good focus group for us as well. And they will yeah. come in and try it as well. And so for, I may give you an example, like our head of product development and culinary innovation is a, a, a very great gentleman who 
you know, has decades of meat industry experience himself. So uh, I would trust his palate yeah. over mine and any day. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, eaten a lot more meat than you have. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. He's been working in the meat industry like as long as I've been alive, probably. Yeah, so you, no competition there. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that's for, yeah, that's that's really cool, and I, I love that it's kind of a sneaky way to be way more environmentally friendly. Just yeah, a, a really yeah. clever way to do it. Um, as we start to wrap up here, I'm, I'm curious. So you're doing all of these really cool things with um, Better Meat Co. You're obviously a big um, fan of the clean meat movement, and there's tons going on there. But I'm curious to know, like on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, when you come home or you're at work, what do you do to be environmentally friendly? Hmm. Well, you know, first of all, I'm vegan. So that's automatically like limiting my emissions in a yeah. very, uh, in a very dramatic way. Um, but uh, there are smaller actions that I take. Mm -hmm. uh, like, for example, I won't throw any food away, all, all of my, uh, anything from my work or home that uh, is biodegradable is going to never go into a landfill. So I will either uh, compost it or uh, sometimes like, you know, leave it out in, in the woods or whatever near wherever I am, uh, which is what I do sometimes is I actually like, like at night seeing like raccoons and skunks oh, and cool. possums and enjoying like the largesse of my life. But um, so, um, you know, uh, you know, the car that my wife and I share is a used hybrid. Um, I wish that we didn't need a car at all. I would much prefer not to own a car, but uh, where we live is sadly necessary since we don't live in a walking community. But I do think that other people, like when they look at um, cars, I mean, it is better to buy used no matter what. Like it's yeah. better to buy a used conventional car than a new hybrid. Uh, we did, you know, what I think is the best of both worlds, which is about a used hybrid. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the future, you know, should we ever be in the car market again? I would like to be able to buy like a used all electric car as well. Um, cool. And, you know, there's other things that we'll do. Like, I pretty much don't buy any new clothing. Um, I mean, my wife, I'm, I'm accused of being, like, anesthetic or, like, a minimalist, um, which is, like, much to my wife's chagrin. Um, but, you know, nearly, I mean, you know, also, you know, most of my clothing is, is I buy used. So I'm just, a, I'm a big proponent of um, not creating new things in the world where we yeah. already have an overabundance of everything that we need. I think that's it's a really good point. The the used concept is so important as I'm finding out because that what you said about the cars, um, I didn't really realize that it's better to keep your gas guzzling car than to buy an electric one, just because a the, new electric one, a new yeah. a new electric one, yeah, exactly because the amount yeah. of emissions it takes and just the not just the emissions but you have to mine all the metal and yes. That's right. Yeah, that, that's the bigger issue is just creating all of this stuff. Yeah, like that's that's the biggest issue. Like the big the big environmental footprint is like making all this stuff. Yeah, making this so stuff. and that's for cars, that's for clothing, it's so much. And so if I could buy my food used, I would. Uh, <laughs> but um, but I would draw the line I, I somewhere. Say, <laughs> yeah, uh, I will say though. I, I mean, actually, I kind of do in that um, there's a chain that's primarily based in California. It's called Grocery Outlet. And okay. uh, it's like a, it, they primarily sell things that are uh, other grocery stores uh, aren't going to sell. So um, oh. it's stuff that's nearing expiration. Mm -hmm. It is stuff that has like product packaging problems. Like it might have the wrong label or it might have like, you know, uh, maybe companies are upgrading to a new formula and they want to get their old product out quickly. And so grocery outlet actually sells very inexpensive groceries. The, the, you know, the inventory changes every week for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, but, uh, my wife and I love going there cause you get things for much cheaper. And so I'll go there and, and, you know, see things that are nearing expiration that are half the price of what they are at a conventional supermarket. So, yeah. um, you know, it's not buying uh, used food, which would be pretty repulsive, but I guess it, it is as close as you're going to get. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, one one thing I love doing is um, going to the clearance aisle of, of a supermarket because mm. everything's about to be thrown away and I, just, I cannot bear it. So I go there and just snag stuff up. And it's cool because like you never know what you're going to get. Life's like a box of chocolates. So it's always <laughs> it's always fun. You get to pick new things and, and sometimes it's try funny. something different. And, that's yeah. a good line, Daniel. Life is like a box of chocolates. You should <laughs> you should promote that. Maybe somebody will put it in a movie. Yeah, there you go. I think you're <laughs> onto something. Um, well, thank you so much, Paul. I think this is uh, what the work you're doing is so awesome. I loved hearing all about it. Um, 
you already said your website uh, for the book, cleanmeatbook.com. Um, yes. You have a couple of other websites. Where can we find you if we're interested in learning about uh, the Better Meat Co. and about your work? Because you do TEDx. Sure. Yeah, easiest thing is just to go to my personal website. It's paul-shapiro.com. Again, that's paul-shapiro.com. And you can get in touch with me, email me, uh, link over to the Better Meat Co. or to cleanmeatbook.com as well from there. But point is, you're always welcome to get in touch with me. If I can be helpful for you in some way, I would really love to be. So uh, always feel free to get in touch. That's so awesome. Yeah, well, thanks again, Paul. It, the work you're doing is just so cool. And it was, a, it was a pleasure talking with you. It's so great to talk with you too, Daniel. Thanks again. Thanks. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. I had a lot of fun talking to Paul. I learned a lot. I hope you did too. Uh, so if you want to see the Better Meat Co., I, I'm not sure if Paul mentioned it, but it's uh, the website is just bettermeat.co.co. Uh, and you can find his Twitter handle at Better Meat Co. Same thing with Instagram at Better Meat Co. Tag us at Sustainability Matters today. If you enjoyed the episode, tell us you gave it a listen uh, and tag tag Paul and Better Meat Co. as well. If you enjoyed the conversation, share this with your friends and give us a five-star rating on, on any platform that you listen to. So I hope you had a great time. I certainly did. And looking forward to speaking with you in the next episode.